Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the IOP Manchester District Branch Talk uh, this month. Um, my name is uh, Pierre Grace. I'm chair of the uh, Manchester District Branch. We are no, we normally do these uh, face to face, and we're hoping we'll get back to those at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University in our Brooks Building. Uh, but tonight we're in for a real treat. We've got a remote talk um, after all the excitement of Mars this week. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Mark Wrigley. Um, he's going to give a very personal memory of the moon landings in 1960, which um, I vaguely recall myself. And I'm much younger than uh, Mark. Uh, I was very young at the time. I remember being woken in the early hours of the morning by my mother and father um, and uh, watching the moon landings. It was uh, just a, a life changing experience. Um, made all the better because my evil, jealous brother wasn't permitted to get up because he was too young. Um, Mark started life in Yorkshire and he went to Leeds to do physics and then spent a lifetime in the uh, mobile communications, mobile phone industry. He was able to travel all over the world, uh, China and Japan, and more recently has been on the IOP Council, um, was chair of the Yorkshire um, Committee, and um, he's also got, uh, incredibly, a PGCE as well. So I'm going to introduce Mark in a second. If you look on the right hand side of your screen there should be a place where you can ask some questions please ask questions we'll take those at the end and uh, there's a chat box as well so we will put some information on that if we need to alert you to other links and um, i'll just say mark it's a pleasure to see you um, and uh, you're welcome to start all right well thank you very much i'm just going to boot up my uh, my screen here and uh, And you should have a picture of the moon rotating, which um, has nothing at all to do with the Apollo moon missions, but is a nice, pretty picture. Um, OK. Right. Well, I, I've called the talk Analog Moon. And um, when I talk to people who are physicists, there's usually two reasons that they give me that they became a physicist. One is that they used to do stuff, uh, model aircraft, home electronics. The other is that there's some sort of space mission that um, really impressed them. So for me, it was the Apollo moon landings. But uh, for example, my son uh, was uh, enthused by Beagle 2. And many people talked to me about the space shuttle. And um, so what I'm going to do is talk about how that uh, impacted me when I was 16 years old. Um, and also, I'm going to punctuate the, the talk by some of the things we didn't see or didn't grasp when people were seeing the moon landings for the first time. Because there, there was um, quite, uh, things were quite close to disaster on, on the very first landing. I thought I'd just mention, um, it. We, we all celebrated 50 years of the Apollo moon landings, which is now uh, getting to be a couple of years ago. Um, so what was happening 50 years ago now? Uh, and that was 50 years ago now, the uh, crew of Apollo 14 had safely returned to Earth. That's uh, Al Shepard, uh, Stu Rosa and Ed Mitchell. Um, quite a feat because it was only the previous May uh, the, the Apollo 13 mission nearly ended in disaster. So these guys had got themselves back up and running within less than a year. So what was happening in Britain in the late 1960s? Um, well, quite, quite turbulent times. Um, of course, all of this is before internet and um, home computing and all the things we uh, accept today. Um, Britain wasn't even in the European community. Um, we had a massive um, balance of payments deficit. And in 1967, Harold Wilson had devalued the pound. Um, later, they were having a uh, campaign to get people to buy British things instead of importing goods. And um, you'll see there that there was even a song, I'm Back in Britain by Bruce Forsyth. Um, Enoch Powell who was doing his Rivers of Blood speech. Concord was doing its maiden flights. There was riot, uh, there were demonstrations um, at, 
outside the American Embassy in London. And you'll see the M1 there. Um, as a Sheffield lad, um, late 60s, I think 1969, the M1 actually reached Sheffield. And this was my life in, nine, in the late 60s. Um, I was already beginning to be a bit of a geek. Um, I was extremely proud that I could grow a moustache and annoy my teachers with it. Um, but my life was um, home electronics. Uh, the circuit in the middle there is made from germanium transistors, uh, pirate radio, uh, home photography, darkroom work, um, and um, actually messing around with old televisions and getting them to work. And then in 1968, at Christmas, on Christmas Eve, this happened. And um, this is a very recognizable image, uh, which I think after it's been taken, uh, perhaps becomes less surprising. But at the time we saw the first earth rise, um, the, um, the photograph had quite an effect. And it was taken by the crew of Apollo 8. Uh, what was special about this mission was that this is the first time that, the, that a crew had left Earth orbit. The Americans had caught wind that the Russians were going to do something quite spectacular. So NASA pulled forward the Apollo 8 mission, which should have been later in, 90, in 1969, and sent three men in lunar orbit. And you'll see that what they have to do here is, once they've been injected into lunar orbit by the Saturn V uh, third stage, they then have to fire their command, uh, the command and service module engines on the backside of the moon while they're out of radio contact and get into lunar orbit. Um, so I'm going to actually play you a little video, which I, I'd, I'd rather like, and it's it's the crew noticing the Earth rise and um, and getting the first first pictures. So they, the simulation there was taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter uh, information. So I decided I wanted to record this stuff. This is in the days before video uh, home domestic video tape recorders. Um, at the time, there were three television channels. And I decided the first thing I wanted to do was see if I could record audio. Um, so. I had a very accommodating father who let me use his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which, which was quite a bit, bit of kit in those days. Uh, and this was actually the, the exact recorder that I used in the picture. So I started off um, and I thought the best thing I could do is put the microphone from the tape recorder as close as possible to the television loudspeaker and see if I could uh, pick up the sound that way with some reasonable quality. Unfortunately, another member of our household thought differently. We had a budget regard. And my first recordings were um, punctuated by a very excited budget regard who seemed to light the Apollo moon landings. So I actually wired this thing to the TV set. Um, and um, you, not too difficult to do, but you have to be very careful with the old fashioned uh, television sets like this. If somebody had accidentally wired the polarity of the plug the wrong way around, then it would make the chassis live. Um, so you sort of had to know what you're doing. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how this thing works, how this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder works. Um, this is actually before the days of cassettes, which uh, are coming back into popularity. And the device has a um, quarter-inch um, piece of magnetic tape that moves across 
uh, and I'm not sure if my, uh, let me see if I can, it's not gonna let me do it. Uh, so it has um, a magnetic tape that moves, moves across some tape heads. And uh, you can see at the bottom left, there are three tape heads. The, the first one is actually to erase what was ever on the tape before. Uh, the second one is to record the sound. And the third one, if you've got a very expensive tape recorder, is to monitor what you've just recorded. So shortly after you've recorded it, you can pick it up and listen to it. The tape runs at different speeds. The faster it goes, the higher frequencies you can record. The slower it goes, the longer the tape will last. And to make the tapes last longer, they, they introduce the idea of having four tracks. So you'll see on the top left picture that um, a single track tape just goes one way and that's it, you've finished. A two track tape, you can record and then turn everything over and record again. And with a four track, which this machine was, and you can see a little button in the middle of the machine, you can switch it so that you actually can record both, both ways and then do it a second time. So you get effectively four times of the recording time. And I, of course, developed quite a lot of tapes, which I still have. Uh, and so I'm, I've been busy actually putting some of this stuff onto uh, uh, digital format and, and sharing them on websites. So let's have a look at the television. Um, quite different. So in 1964, the BBC introduced a third television channel. Before 1964, there were just two channels. That was BBC and ITV. In 1967, they introduced colour for the first time. And the transmissions were all on uh, on the VHF band, so uh, on band one and band three. So BBC on band one and ITV on band three. And there aren't many of these antenna left now, but th these uh, large antenna for, for band one transmissions were quite a common sight in the 60s. Inside the te television, uh, they were always very dusty and dirty. They were uh, powered by valves. Uh, you can see the back of the cathode ray tube there, and on the right-hand side, there's the ultra-high tension, which um, powers the beam. Um, I found to my cost that um, the UHT remains powered some, quite some time after you switch the set off. Um, so I had a, had a few um, had a few accidents. Um, the resolution of, of the uh, BBC One and, and ITV uh, was 405 lines uh, interlaced. Uh, that simply means that the TV scans about 200 lines and then goes back and fills in the gaps between them. And it has a frame rate of 25 frames per second. The new television service, the new um, BBC Two, was on a slightly higher resolution, which was 625 lines, which I think we're all familiar with and was also interlaced. And just as a comparison to what we have today, um, we're quite familiar with things like 1080p and 1080i, which is uh, 1080p uh, um, is a progressive scan, so it doesn't fill in between, it just scans down. <coughs> and uh, that, that resolution now can be regarded as 1K. So um, if, you, if you have a 4K set, it has um, twice the resol uh, twice the line resolution and twice the the horizontal resolution. The sort of TV cameras which were carried on board the Apollo program uh, had a lot less resolution and a lot lower frame rate. So we're looking at things which had thing uh, resolutions of around about 300 lines and very slow frame rates of of 10 frames per second. So the next thing that I wanted to do was take some photographs of the missions. So I got video, I got some photographic record as well as sound. And I was quite inspired. Um, Apollo 10 uh, took place uh, in, uh, this was the penultimate mission before somebody actually landed on the moon. The mascot there is uh, Snoopy and in fact the the command module was called Charlie Brown and the lunar module was called Snoopy. And um, 
I'll just uh, play a little excerpt. So by this time, I, I'd got the tape recording down to a fine art. So I'll leave that there. Um, the tape recorder you saw was actually something that I'd found at an antiques fair, and it was the start of uh, resurrecting this project. Uh, it was really quite like uh, opening a time capsule to put these recordings that I'd made nearly 50 years before and listen to them again um, so many years later. So I was saying about photography and getting images from the TV. I used a 35 millimeter camera, which was um, very low cost. Ironically, it was made in the Soviet Union and it was called a Zenith B. Um, the slowest speed it had was a 30th of a second. And so on Apollo 10, I used it to create a scrapbook of images uh, which go through the whole mission. So it gave me lots of practice at brushing up my darkroom techniques uh, to photograph and process all this. Um, and I still have that scrapbook today. Uh, I particularly, it was taken by one of the crew on Apollo 10, who was an extremely charismatic gentleman called, um, uh, called jo uh, John Young. Um, Young was famous for a sandwich incident. Um, on uh, Gemini 3, which um, took place in 1965, Wally Sherrard had dared Young and Grissom to take on board a corned beef sandwich, which they did and hid in their space suit uh, and proceeded to try and eat it on, bo uh, on board in, while they were in orbit. Um, now, the thing about corned beef sandwiches is that they have crumbs and crumbs and weightlessness and uh, finely tuned uh, spacecraft don't go together. And the whole incident resulted in the, um, resulted in a hearing in the House of Representatives uh, where they were taken to task about what they'd done. And in fact, um, they were uh, rep represented by James Webb, who um, you will probably know for the telescope that's going to be launched next year. So here's the next step, which was recording uh, the video. So there were no home video recorders, but there were these things called cine cameras, and they were quite popular in the 1960s. This is the actual model that I used. It's a Bell and Howell, and it's it's a standard eight cine camera. Um, it has 16 millimeter film, which you can see in the top right. And it's played to record by loading up with film, running the film through, which takes about two minutes, and then turning the film over and recording on the other side. You then send the whole thing away to be processed by a processing lab who, splice, who cut down the center of the film for you and return an eight millimeter wide film for you to put into your projector. I found that 
it wasn't bright enough uh, to take pictures from the TV with standard film. So I got hold of some very high speed. So in in these days it would be in today they would be known as ISO. So this is 400 ISO film, and um, was able to get images from the TV screen. Here's here's what it looks like to load inside, and here's some of the film which I took uh, that came back. This is is a picture of the top of the Saturn V. Uh, I've since actually had this uh, digitized, uh, so I have a company who has actually digitized this frame by frame. And to give you some idea of what it looks like, uh, then um, I'll just show you a short clip. So that was actually a clip of some film taken um, by NASA and released afterwards. And it, it gives an idea of the quality that I could get. So the next bit I'm gonna show you is to do with the landing. So um, we all heard uh, the crew land and I don't think many of us at the time realized what was going on. Um, there were a series of problems. Um, the uh, computer started to overload. Uh, the area that was chosen for landing was a boulder field. Um, so I'm going to show you some clips now. Um, the clip is about something called the 1201 alarm. And um, this piece of film that I'm about to show you has been put together in the last couple of years. A gentleman called Stephen Slater has gone through all the audio that was recorded at the time and matched it to 60 millimeter film coverage that was taken in mission control. And so you, what you're gonna see is uh, sometimes there is no uh, camera coverage, uh, but sometimes you will actually see the controllers uh, in mission control with lip sync. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro, go. Fido, go. Guidance, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Econ, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Stopping arm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201. 1201 alarm. Same time, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same time, we're go. Flight side or right on, real good. Roger. 47 degrees, Roger. How's our margin looking, Bob? It looks okay. We're okay. about four and a half. Roger. So that was the 1201 alarm. Um, what was actually happening there is that uh, Buzz Aldrin had. Um, left a piece of uh, radar equipment switched on. Um, the the piece of ra the radar that they'd been using was designed to help them track back to the command module if there was a problem. Uh, it had been put into slew mode and uh, unbeknown uh, to anyone, it was still trying to talk to the computer, which was then getting an executive overload. Um, the 1201 alarm, uh, had been done in uh, simulation 11 days before launch. So um, the flight uh, simulator manager, uh, Rick Coos, had actually gone through this particular uh, um, alarm and the crew aborted the mission in simulation. And after that, uh, the, uh, got the, he got together with a guy called Steve Bales, who, who was the guidance officer. And Steve Bales talked to a guy called Jack Garman. And Jack um, actually went through all the alarms and wrote them out and put them on his desk under a piece of perspex or plexiglass should uh, an alarm happen again. Uh, and uh, in fact, here's, here's his list of alarms. And so when the alarm was called out by the um, crew as they were landing, they were able to respond almost immediately. Right, so the next part of the trajectory is um, 
the the actual landing so now the the craft is actually should normally be under automatic um, um, control and uh, is due to rotate and land uh, the other bit that you'll hear in the next piece of um, of audio is um, contact so um, the Apollo um, lunar module has these uh, um, contact points underneath the foot pads so when those contact points touch the surface the engines cut out so that's one thing you'll hear the other thing that you you will hear is that um, is that the fuel uh, will be called out this is in terms of how much fuel they've got left in time so you will hear people say 60 seconds 30 seconds and that's how much fuel they've got left. And I'm going to leave it later to the capsule communicator to explain what all that means. But um, if you listen carefully, you should hear it. Down two and a half. Forward. 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 Down two and a half. So you would have heard um, the gentleman there who couldn't quite say tranquility, um, and um, we actually have a, a little. In we actually have a little interview with him, and um, he is the capsule communicator. So the deal is that only one person is allowed to talk to the astronauts from ground at a time, and that person is called Capcom. And so. Um, well, I will then play an interview with the Capcom for Apollo 11 on that landing. I was privileged to uh, be the uh, Capcom for Apollo 11 during the first lunar landing. And we had uh, trained for a couple of months uh, to uh, get as perfect as we could uh, on this uh, landing uh, procedures. And as uh, as we started the actual landing sequence, uh, uh, things started to go not quite right. Uh, we first started having problems with our uh, communications. We had to reorient the spacecraft. Uh, then we had a major problem, I thought, was the computer uh, warning. And uh, master alarm came on, computer says 1201, 1201, which was an alarm code. And I had not a clue what that was. And I said, oh, the mission is over in my mind. I was saying, we got to abort. But the guidance guy, uh, Steve Bale, said, we're go flight. We're going at the time. We're go flight. OK, we're going. We're going. Think high. We're go. As we continue down, we continue to have these uh, alarm codes. Roger, we got you. We're going in alarm. So we continued down. But then we discovered that when Neil pitched over to see the landing site for the first time, we had him targeted into a big boulder field, and it was not suitable for landing. So he had to level off at about four or 500 feet above the moon, fly horizontally for uh, about a mile or more, then slow down uh, his forward velocity, and then start down. Well, all that took a lot of fuel. So now we're getting a fuel problem. 
And the last two calls that we had for mission control was to the spacecraft was going to be uh, Eagle 60 seconds. That meaning he had 60 seconds to land. Uh, and then after that would be an abort. 60 seconds. And you can imagine the tension is rising in the in the room, where there's a lot of activity and uh, sub conversations usually going on. Mission control it was dead silence, and so uh, uh, he's still in the landing descent. And then I call Eagle thirty seconds. He had thirty more seconds to land, or there would be another board. Well, about thirteen seconds later, according to my stopwatch. Uh, I heard uh, Buzz Aldrin say, uh, contact, engine stop. And so we knew they were on the ground, uh, hopefully right side up. And uh, then there was a pause. And Neil came back just so in such cool manner. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And my resp I was so excited when I my response came out first <laughs> roger twang and i knew that wasn't right so i corrected it in the middle mid word twang i mean tranquility we copy your own the ground you got a bunch of guys are about to turn blue we're breathing again and so we all erupted in cheers at that point and uh so uh what started out as a descent that looked like it was going to be uh aborted even down to the last few seconds uh uh, and Neil and Buzz were so uh, skilled that they just pulled it, up, pulled it all off. So while all that was happening, uh, our friends in Manchester were monitoring the um, Apollo moon landing. Um, so this is a nice little uh, story uh, that um, I throw at conspiracy theory buffs. Um, the uh, Droddle Bank was uh, monitoring the um, lunar module as it landed and measuring its Doppler frequencies. So the graph that you can see on the right hand side, first of all, there's a lot of up and down, up and down for calibration. And then you will see a smooth curve. And that smooth curve is the Apollo uh, lunar module landing. You can then see some lumpy bits and that is the point at which Neil Armstrong took over the control of the lunar module and flew it by hand. And then you'll see a flat line, which is simply the flat line from the lunar module having landed and the rotation of the moon. So um, I often use this when people start talking about conspiracy theories and I'm sort of, this is really, <laughs> it's a really difficult thing to do as a conspiracy. So here's the things that we all are all familiar with. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, AOS, over. Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. They're setting up the flight now. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. They got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes from the limit. Are you getting a TV picture now, Justin? So those would be the first television pictures that we saw live. All the pictures you've seen before have been taken from 16 millimeter cameras, which were mounted on the lunar module as it landed. And of course, we'd have to wait until the film was returned to see it. So those were the first live pictures. And there was a television camera that was mounted in the side of the lunar module, which dropped down and was able to relay photographs of the first steps down the ladder onto the moon. So what about color? Um, there were some color transmissions uh, from the moon. Um, the uh, Apollo 11 um, uh, capsule had a color camera on board, but it was not taken down onto the surface. It remained in the command module. Uh, here's one of the color TV cameras that were used and used more frequently on later missions. Uh, and if you can read upside down, 
uh, you'll see actually that some of these frame rates are very low indeed. So they've got six frames per second and 12 frames per second. The way that the color TV cameras worked was that they had a rotating red, green, blue disc in front of the camera. So that in fact, what it was doing was sending a low frame rate back and every third frame would be the same color. So you'd get one frame red, one frame green, one frame blue, and that would be built up when the image was received. If you weren't lucky enough to have a color television, and not many people did in 1969, there were various ways that you could see the color images from the moon. Many of the newspapers released six, eight millimeter color films uh, of the moon landings. And these would be a compilation of the uh, 16 millimeter films which were taken by the astronauts on the trip and brought back uh, in better resolution than the television pictures. There was a lot of color photography uh, um, to, to using uh, Hasselblad cameras. In fact, if you want a Hasselblad camera, I understand that between the Apollo 11 and the Apollo 17 mission, there are 12 Hasselblads left on the surface of the moon. Um, you can see here that it is on the front of the astronauts pack. So the best way to actually see these color photographs that were taken uh, was to go out and buy a, a publication. Uh, and one of the best was Life magazine who uh, covered the uh, moon landings very well and even had a special edition uh, of the moon landings. And it really was the, the sort of best way to get an idea of what the color looked like. So many years later, um, I would take my Life magazine and get Buzz Aldrin to sign it, which he did very nicely for me for the fee of 80 pounds. So, Two years ago, uh, we were looking at the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. Uh, and um, I started to uh, digitize a lot of the tapes that I've got. Uh, they are very interesting to listen to, not just uh, the bits um, of the astronauts talking, but some of the, particularly the BBC programs, and the amount of depth uh, that the programs go into compared to television documentaries today. Uh, the other thing that happened was that um, I was uh, approached by the Bradford Media Museum or Bradford Science and Media Museum uh, and uh, they wanted to display uh, some of uh, what I'd done. So as well as of course of having tapes and, and uh, eight, um, eight millimeter films, I've got various things I've collected over the years. And these were put on display in the Bradford Museum. And the eagle-eyed will have noticed uh, that they also put the budgie regard in there for the full story. And they basically set up a couple of cabinets uh, with some of the photographs that I'd taken. And um, it was actually quite, quite nice to pull out all these things which um, I'd collected in the late 60s. They also made a video, a five minute video, and I think it's a really good summary of my enthusiasm for the Apollo missions and the impact that it had on me uh, as a teenager. So I'm going to play you that. It'd take about five minutes. My name is Mark Wrigley. I'm a physicist and I took my physics degree in the 1970s. I've spent most of my life working in mobile telecoms. So on the day of the Apollo 11 landings, which actually was the night for Britain, um, I was sitting in front of our family television set with my father's cine camera, filming the whole event and at the same time recording the sound on his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. When we see coverage now of the moon landings, what we generally see is high quality film that the astronauts brought back, which has been edited and condensed into a few minutes. When I was recording this, things went on for hours, uh, and it really actually was quite boring. Um, there would be some event happen, uh, but then on the night of the moon landings, we had something like six hours of television, 
So it did actually get a little bit boring in, in between. But the thing that I found quite interesting is I recorded most of the sound of that. I didn't get all the pictures. And when you listen to the uh, programs that the BBC were putting out, it's really quite deep and quite interesting. And so there's a lot of information there that you'd otherwise miss. So that's one of the reasons I, I'm quite enthusiastic about digitizing all that so other people can listen to them. So all five engines of the second stage have ignited. And the second stage is moving it yeah, on successfully. Well, the Houston thrusters go all engines. You're looking good. Before we had digital cameras, we had cinema cameras. And actually, these are quite expensive pieces of kit. Uh, so the one I used was my, my father's. But the thing I had to sort out was getting some sort of film that was sensitive enough to get pictures from a TV set instead of being outside in the sunshine. So I found a company that made high-speed black and white film. And that's what I used. And uh, it, it was quite expensive for somebody on pocket money. So it, I could get about four minutes filming out of one film. And to do it, you put the film through the camera, turn it over like it's a record, and put it through a second time, and then send it off to some place in Germany where it can process and come back. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. So I got hold of what's called a, a Zenith 3M camera, which was a low-cost, Soviet, ironically Soviet-made camera. And I started shooting the TV screen, putting the camera on a tripod in front of the TV, using the slowest speed it had got, which was a thirtieth of a second. And through a lot of technical stuff, this actually caused a little bit of a pattern on the screen, but it was good enough. And then I went off and developed my own pictures. Um, so it really got me into black and white photography and I was doing stuff like rolling my own films and trying to get things as cheap as possible and then and then printing things out and making them into scrapbooks. And I'd also put uh, newspaper articles in, in the same scrapbook. And I, I think I stopped doing it around about Apollo 12. And that was when I went off to university and had to do other things. One of the things that was interesting at the time is if you really wanted to get colour images, of what happened and look at the colour photos. The best thing to do is to go and buy a magazine. So I used to regularly buy Life magazine, which had really good coverage. In later life, I was able to travel a lot. I was working abroad and able to travel to places. So I went back to the NASA center in Florida several times and bought this. And it was quite interesting because what I thought I'd never be able to record was there for sale in NASA in the form of a videotape of most of the stuff I've ever recorded. And in fact, I was there 25 years ago because one of the things I bought was a special edition of a magazine that they printed for the 25th anniversary of the Apollo moon landings, which I, I've still got. And it's always been a bit of a thrill to me in terms of how technology has gone forward because then we've gone into DVDs and Blu ray. And you can actually get better and better images of the Apollo moon landing, which I was trying to record. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. So you can imagine I was pretty obsessed by all this as a, as a teenager. I was following the missions and I was so excited and I could see lots of things in the future that, that could happen. Uh, and I, I went to talk to my careers master at school about this, and he, he listened to what I got to say, and he said, you should be a woodwork teacher. And I think that's the point at which I really rebelled in a good way. I thought, oh, I want to be an astronaut. And I thought the best way to do this is to go and study physics and get a degree in physics. So I think that conversation actually spurred me on to go get the qualifications I needed to go to university and do physics degree. Okay, and there you have it. Um, i just make some references uh, if you uh, want to find out more. Uh, I'm slowly putting stuff onto this website, which is called 1201alarm.org. 
uh, and you and I think I've actually put that in the comments if you want to go and see what's there at the moment. Um, there's a Facebook group and an, in, and an Instagram group. Uh, if you want to contact me, my email address is there. Um, there are some very good books written by people who were involved at the time. Uh, I can thoroughly recommend Gene Kranz's book called Failure is Not an Option uh, because he was also the mission controller during the Apollo 13 mission. Um, the um, Mike Collins, who was the one of the three Apollo 11 astronauts who didn't land on the moon and stayed in the command module, uh, has written a book called Carrying the Fire, which is very interesting. And these guys tend to have come through test pilot uh, through to astronaut. Um, um, and then there's some popular stuff. Uh, so later at the end of the, at the end, after we've done questions, I'm going to play a track from a group called Public Service Broadcasting, um, who actually very kindly replied to my email asking if uh, they could waive the copyright and let me play their track. So we'll do that as a, as a play out. The movie Apollo 11 is incredibly good. It was released for the 50th anniversary. Uh, the guy I mentioned, Stephen Slater, has done a lot of the lip sync, which has never been done before. And there is uh, footage which has been restored, some of which has never been seen before. Um, so that is uh, well worth a look. Um, and um, that's it. So thank you very much. I am just about to work out how to uh, relinquish control. That's fantastic, uh, Mark. Thank you so much. That was um, that was truly amazing. It uh, brought back lots of memories for myself and I think for, for the people here who've listened. Um, you said you'll take a few questions and there have been yep. a couple of questions. Um, so Rebecca Walker's asked one about what do we think the uh, the, the team will have encountered, what problems the team will have encountered um, regarding the camera and recording equipment on the Mars rover? I know you're an expert, but... Uh... Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I am absolutely blown away by uh, the latest uh, pictures from the Mars rover. Um, I've seen a video of the parachute opening uh, and the landing. Um, so um, I think they probably uh, have a lot... Uh, a lot easier time uh, because I think the, the, the thing is in in nineteen in the nineteen sixties a lot of the components of these cameras um, were mechanical. Um, so you know I mentioned the the color camera with a rotating disc, um, and obviously uh, you know Hasselblads are completely mechanical devices. Uh, so I would expect the reliability is better. Um, I. I'd, I'd, I'm amazed at, at modern camera technology. I, I play with uh, Raspberry Pi cameras, and um, you know, for fifteen pounds, you can get incredibly uh, good uh, little camera. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping they have less less problems. Um, yeah, um, I'm amazed as well. I'm, I'm ably supported. Should mention I'm ably supported here by Bethany Wooden, who's in the background, making sure we're technically okay. And um, one of the things I did think about was your recordings, especially so many of the um, little bits of things you've shown there um, and played. I haven't seen before. And um, one of our colleagues, Kevin Kilbert, who works for the Manchester Astronomical Society, he did something similar to you when he was about 19, and his recordings were collected by the. Uh, BBC archive and put into that. Mm -hmm. I just wondered whether you'd offered them to them. I know you've, you've um, they're in the well, uh, Bradford Museum. Yeah. Um, the the well the, the the Bradford Museum have played them, and in fact, uh, when you saw that little five minute video that they'd made, they very kindly synced up the sound that I'd recorded with the uh, with the eight millimeter films. Um, I the next stage was going to be uh, to work with Stephen Slater. Uh, the gentleman I keep mentioning of who does the lip sync and um, he's quite an archivist for audio uh, and we were going to, uh, I, in fact what I was going to do was uh, take a digital copy of all the tapes and then hand them over to him uh, and then the pandemic happened so uh, we, we've not yeah, really been in pandemic. touch since. Yeah. Uh, there's another was an observation here by John Morell. He said he he recalls going to his uh, head teacher and uh, getting permission, trying to get permission anyway to uh, come in late the next day uh, because it was very early in the morning. I seemed to, it was certainly I think my parents got me up at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, we were I, definitely on holiday um, in Ireland. Yeah. We finished much earlier, so 
Is that your yes. reflex? Was it was yeah. I, right. I had a similar. I had a similar thing. Um, so at the time this happened, um, I it was before GCSEs in England, and um, so I was doing O levels. Uh, and um, in fact, I'd done my O levels, and I was waiting for the results. So we were going into school, or uh, you know, doing sports and, and not much else. And um, I'd never been up all night before. <laughs> <laughs> right about lunchtime, I said, "Can I go home?" <laughs> and they were it's not very sympathetic. You. Well, you shouldn't have stayed up all night, you know, <laughs> as if nothing had happened during the night. You know, it's quite funny. <laughs> well. Well, um, Helen Hutchinson, she asked a question similar to one. I, I, I was intrigued by the amount of trial and error you, you had before that, the amount of practice you had. And she asked, how did you learn to do all that technical stuff as a teenager? Um, I definitely remember at the same age not being able to do that. Oh, um, a bit of learnt from from my father. Um, so. Um, my father, who actually sadly died a couple of months ago, um, uh, was a great um, um, photographic recorder of, of actually of Sheffield. Uh, he's got he had something like eighteen thousand negatives of Sheffield, um, and much to my mother's disdain, would we, we, we'll be told, "Why don't you take pictures of the family?" Um, and but he had some sort of foresight, so I learned my darkroom techniques and all that from him. And he did have a, a cine camera, um, and then I I I'd pick stuff up. Um, I was an uh, the mixture of things, and I I guess I'm still like this today because I love magazines. But uh, Meccano magazine, um, Practical Wireless, uh, all these bits of information um, I'd I'd put together. And I did actually have a time when I was really enthusiastic about um, about fixing TV sets. Um, so um, about the time all this was happening, people were getting rid of their old television because they wanted, it couldn't get BBC Two. So I suddenly was donated. I had about five TV sets in my bedroom at various states of, of repair. Um, so yeah, it was picking bits up like that. I mean, I shouldn't say this as an as uh, educationalist, but to be quite honest, the stuff I learned by reading Practical Wireless and messing around with this stuff, has been much more useful in my career than a lot of the things I was taught at school. <laughs> Steady. Well, <laughs> well, I must say it's uh, it's uh, just in anticipation of this, uh, I uh, went back to my old copy of the Philadelphia Inquirer. I showed it to you before from yeah, yeah. Uh, the next day. Um, it was just amazing wall to wall coverage. And um, I was sent a book recently, Tim O'Reilly on Accidental Journey. It's just the most amazing book about the moon and even Brian Eno's CD, um, Moon, which I think he did in 19, if you're listening to that in the car. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it has been amazing. Um, Yogesh Patel asked a question. Um, he would, or he, sorry, he says he would also recommend the book uh, Moon Dust. So I'll make a note yep. of that as well. Yeah. Right. Um, there doesn't seem to be any other questions. Um, we're going to make this available to people. Um, and so people can get the recording of this and go through it again. And if people do have questions that they think of, you're willing to accept them, we'll send them to you and you would be yep. absolutely good answering those. If people suddenly think of something and they would like to ask, we, we especially any young people um, here, we know we've got people from all over, well, different parts of the world really are, are here tonight, but uh, any young people have got any questions, particularly um, because of the events of this week, they might want to ask you, that would be, if they were inspired by these uh, things, that would be great. Um, and I'd just like to thank you once again, Mark.